Welcome back to your Vista Baptist Church, Pastor Matt. So I want to apologize for not being on the screen today. I'm being videoed. The office is getting painted. Um, we're making some improvements in my office. So I figured it would be easier for me just to go through the text and we'll focus in on the text without seeing my face as a distraction. So thank you for tuning in. We are in Second Peter chapter 3. 9 and 10. And we're in this discourse of Peter talking about God's coming, um, when the Lord returns, and why there's an apparent delay or seeming slowness to God's return, uh, to Christ's return in particular. And Peter has been talking about how these false teachers, false prophets, have been using that as an excuse to avoid doing what is right, um, and using it as an excuse to, to essentially try to lead people astray. And so we get into 9 and 10. And verse 9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief on the day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. What we see here is we want to start observing. Well, we know that we're still talking about this, this delay, this process of delay. So remember, the false teachers, false prophets were saying that the Lord's return was delayed. In, in other words, they were not saying that God was sovereign. They were saying that for some reason God could not return. He could not send his son back. And so this delay is an attack essentially on God being sovereign. So the delay on his promise. So why would they be attacking God's sovereignty? Well, if they could undermine the fact that God is in control, if they could get rid of that, it would give them some leeway, some ability to say that God is not as powerful as he says he is. And so Peter takes this on, and we know from the Epicureans, uh, a sect of, of Greek thinkers that they were arguing that this delay of judgment was God not being in control. He was not providentially um, having the ability to punish the wicked. And so that's the argument that there that his delay is because he doesn't have control. He doesn't have the divine providence. And we, we know Jesus spoke about this many times. Matthew 24, 48 says, But if that wicked servant says in his heart, My master is delayed. Right? This whole delaying, staying away a long time. Or in Habakkuk. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. So God has already given a heads up. He's already let us know that his timing is not our timing. So let me put Matthew 24, 48. I have to pardon my handwriting. And Habakkuk 2, 3. So both of these speak to the fact that from our perspective, from the human perspective, there seems to be a delay, or there could feel like it, God is delaying in his promised coming, in his promised judgment. And the fear is that we will then start to forget who God is, that God is in control. And so Peter then addresses this. He goes straight to the Epicurean thought, and he says, Not delayed as some understand it, but he is patient with you. So that's interesting. Why would God be patient with us? And then we have a, a section that we're going to come back to and address more 
thoroughly because this is a a hinge point for Arminian theology and it's also a, an area where Calvinism and Arminianism differ on what this means and 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 how to understand this passage and and ultimately how to understand God and and who God is. So we will return to this shortly. But I just wanted to observe I want you to observe that not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements, that's an interesting word, will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed or laid bare, as some translations We'll say, so laid bare, broken up, opened up, or naked is another way we can think of it. Everything will be open before the Lord. So we've observed this text. We've started observing some interesting things. Maybe the works might be an interesting word to, to, to dig a little deeper into. Obviously, this theme of the day of the Lord and the thief, um, that's a common theme in the New Testament. So we want to keep that. Um this heavens will pass away with a loud noise. Man, that sounds a lot like the Old Testament prophets, doesn't it? So that would give us a hint to go to our concordance and maybe look up. Where have we seen this before? Where has it been mentioned before? And that will help us better understand what Peter is getting at. So let's start doing some interpreting. The Lord does not delay his promise. Now, this tells us about God's character. And if we know God's character, we know that Exodus 34, 6 says that the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is full of mercy. Right? So the reason that God is delaying the return of Christ is because he is patient. He is merciful. The uh, Septuagint uses the phrase slow to anger which is the same root word used here in our text from Exodus 34, 6. So Peter is pointing to God's mercy, God's grace, that this characteristic of God, the God who forgives, the God who is slow to anger that we also see in Numbers 14, 18, and he's abounding in love and he's forgiving of sin. And, you know, Jonah, even in Jonah 4, 3, complains about God saying, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And of course, throughout the Old Testament, we see so many other passages about God being kind, about being true, about being patient, ruling in mercy. And we even see it in extra extra writings such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and other Second Temple period literature um, from that time. So First Peter or Second Peter here, he is really bringing this attribute to God. But also we see it in First Peter. First Peter three twenty recognizes this characteristic of God and compares it with the the flood about how God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. And so we see this long sufferingness, which gives us some application, an application point. And I, I want to bring this application out is that if this is our God, if God is a God of mercy, of patience, he is slow to anger. Shouldn't we as Christians also be slow to anger? long-suffering, patient, that should be the mark of a Christian. You, We are what we worship. We turn into what we worship. The gods that you worship, you become more like them. The more you pursue money, the more greedy you become. The more you pursue wealth and, and or let's say prosperity, fame, the more you become... Um, greedy the more you become trying to to load it up but the more you become the more you worship god and you see that jesus christ 
is the perfect image of God, and we see his long suffering, his patience, his slow to anger. We too should be slow to anger. So I'm going to put up here for our application, slow to anger. That's who we should be as Christians, as followers. Our judgments should not be quick. It should not be snap judgments, but we should be slow. Next, as we now approach this not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance, we run into this question. If God does not want, we have this word want here, any to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance, why does he not make that happen? So is God unable to cause repentance? Is Does God not have the ability to bring people to faith? So is God's will thwarted? Or is there something else being said here? So this is a text that an Arminian, and an Arminian is someone who believes that man has free agency or free will. Um, free will in the sense that they can choose, or, or we could even say libertarian free will. Free will that man can choose his destiny, essentially. Man can choose whether to follow God or not to follow God. There is no um, restrictions on his decision. And, and that's a very simple way to say it. It's much more complex, as I'm sure you can imagine. And then the Calvinist believes that God brings some to faith, which we call the elect, and he bring he doesn't bring others. And so this would seem on its face to, to refer to the fact that people can choose to be saved or to be not be saved. So how do we how do we address this? What are the ways that we can understand this passage? And this is where we're going to really dig in a little bit to some grammar. And it's important that we know a little bit about grammar. All right, so the first place we want to look as wanting or wish. This wanting or wish is the reason why he is patient. That's where this clausal force is. It's a it's a participle, meaning that the cause of God's patience is because of a wish, his will, his his desire. And we'll look more at what that word is for any to perish. So this verse is the battleground. We've talked about this between Arminians and Calvinists. The Arminians will argue that God wants all people to be saved, but either through their inability or th- or restriction or e- either through inability or restriction of his own sovereignty, God does not interfere with people's will. Some will argue that the any here refers to any of you. So it's talking to Christians, to believers, to the elect. So not wanting any of you to perish, but all comes to repentance. So we have we have problems with both these positions. The any in this context does mean any of you. It's it's very obvious because of the de, the the dependent participle, which gives the reason why the why the Lord is patient toward you. Right, so, but it's patient with you or towards you. We we see this this brought out here, and this is included. So, not wanting any of you to perish. Now, on his face, that would seem then that God is, or God through Peter is saying that. That God does not want any of Christians to perish. Now, if this is written now to a church congregation, we know that Christians 
people who claim to be Christians, not all of them are saved. And in, you go to any church and, and there's bound to be a few that are not saved who claim to be Christians but are not saved. So the Arminian then would bring up the fact that not everyone listening to this sermon, not everyone listening to this letter from Peter are actually Christians. And so it can't be that this any of you is referring to the elect or the saved. And that, and that would be one of their primary arguments. And, and even in this letter, there are hints that the readership may be mixed, right? Including both believers and, and others who are maybe sitting on the fence. So, based on the historical context, the Calvinist position seems pretty weak. But grammatically, it seems very strong. With the Armenian position, grammatically, it doesn't seem to hold up with the Armenian view, but the whole historical context seems to be against the Calvinistic view. Now, how do we answer this conundrum, right? Because we don't want to leave this as a mystery, though that is one possibility, but let's, let's keep digging. So what is this word wanting? or wishing. It comes from, it's from the verb bulomai, and it re represents a mere wish or, or even just a desire rather than one's resolve. So if you think about this, it, it brings out, let me just write the, the word here, bulomai, which means wish or we could even say like a longing desire a decreed will so it it's not it, it doesn't always say that god decrees this to be the case so you can look at god's will viewed on two planes or two types of God's will. It's what he desires and what he decrees, right? And sometimes we get confused as to, as to what God is saying here because this is not the only instance of this idea of a desired, desired will or a decreed will. For example, we can look at the death of Christ. It says that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. We know that this betrayal was sin. The betrayal of, of Jesus was sin by, by Judas, and it was involved and Satan was involved in that. But it was also part of God's ordained plan. So there's a sense which God willed the delivering up of his son, even though that act was sin. You look at Herod's contempt for Jesus in Luke 23, 11. Pilate, Pilate was spineless in his expediency in Luke 23, 24. And then the Jews crying, crucify him, crucify him, Luke 23, 21. And then, of course, the Gentile soldiers mocking in Luke 23, 36 were all sinful attitudes and deeds. But yet in Acts 4, 27 through 28, Luke expresses his understanding of the sovereignty of God in these acts by recording the prayer of the Jerusalem saints. So it says this, Truly in the city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever thy hand and thy plan, which is bule, had predestined to take place. So we see that Herod, Pilate, the soldiers, the Jewish crowds all lifted their hands to rebel against God the Most High and that their rebellion was sinful service to God's design. So when you look at this idea that God has a decreed will, an open will, and he has a secret will or a 
undergirding will. Having two wills has been described in, in many different ways. Um, we, we know that this is something that's been discussed by theologians and, and, and people have tried to understand the difference. And, and maybe it's a, a, a weakness of our language. The difference between a desire and an actual action um, or a longing for something to go a certain way. So we, we know that God decrees things that he wishes could be a different way, right? He longs for the repentance of his people. He wants people to repent. He wants them to turn from their wickedness. He does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And we see that same concept in in other passages. Ezekiel 18, 32 says, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. We see that God's regret over the perishing of anyone is clear. But then we ask, is this the same, this verse in 2 Peter having the same meaning as like the text in Ezekiel? And then how does it fit with the teaching that God has ordained and decreed that only some will be saved? We have so many scriptures that teach that clear idea, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. So we don't have space to, to do a full exposition of even all these other passages. But we have to be able to recognize the two wills of God, his decreed will and his desired will. So God desires salvation of everyone in one sense, but he does not ultimately decree that all will be saved. And, and some people will say that this is double talk or some type of nonsense. But there are many really good expositors who have explained this and and helped us understand that these two wills it is a is a valid way to understand that so what is peter getting to here well it seems that peter is basing this off of what god has desired rather than what god has decreed and this is really where grammatical understanding of the text really helps us figure out what is being said to us, what God is saying. Um, and we can hold this mystery in our hands that God has ordained some for salvation. So God's sovereignty and man's responsibility held up in, in both hands. And we can recognize that this is a, a mystery. Finally, we know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So we know that it's going to come unexpected. We're not going to know that it's coming. We know that a thief, if he wants to rob a house, he's not going to send you a letter and let you know. He's not going to make an announcement. But they sneak in, and that's how the Lord will come. It was going to come on an unexpected time, an unexpected day. And we have some image, Old Testament imagery here about this loud voice, this coming of Christ. And this is also New Testament imagery. Don't don't think that I'm saying it's one and not the other, but it, it's both. <clears throat> and this idea of the sky being um, the heavens passing away or the sky being rolled back, um, you know, really brings up in my mind stuff from Isaiah where it says the heavens will be rolled back like a scroll. So the main point in this passage that this author is making, that Peter is making, is that God's patience or slowness to anger and his desire that all come to repentance did not mean that the day of the Lord is called off. So it's coming. It will come. This day is going to come at a certain time based on God's plan when he has found the fullness of time for this to happen. Isaiah 34, 4 says that all the stars in the sky will dissolve. The sky will roll up like a scroll and its stars will all wither and the leaves wither on the vine and foliage on the fig, fig tree. 
Revelation talks in a similar way. And so we see this very complicated, the, the, the Greek here is, is, can be pretty complicated, and some of the meaning can be difficult to understand. And this, this word for elements um, has a, a regular meaning, and then some other possible, is found a lot in the second century, but sometimes it's, it's focused on the four elements such as earth, air, fire, and water. Um, or heavenly bodies such as the sun, moon, and stars. So it has a, a, a vast range of meaning. Um, essentially, though, what we want to understand from this and by interpreting this is that everything is going to be dissolved. The earth is going to be remade. And all of us will be laid bare before God, the wicked and the good. All of our, our works that we have done on the earth will be laid open. Will God will reveal our thoughts, our desires, everything about us will be in the open. Every lie you've ever told, every aspect of your life that you have been maybe hiding from others is going to be revealed. And so as Christians, we know that we have nothing to fear from that day. It's going to be a, a joyful day, in fact, because we are going to be glorified in that instance. Our our works, even the bad ones that we have done, even our sinfulness, will be made null and void through the blood of Christ. And God will look on us through Christ. But this is a warning to the unbeliever. And the unbeliever needs to recognize that when the day comes, it will come unexpected. And their time for repentance will have passed. So now is the time to repent from our sins, to turn to God, and to be comforted. And that can be our application point for verse 10. So I hope this was encouraging to you. Until we see each other again, God bless and take care. Mm-hmm.